good. Wow. I know that it, that had to sound as good online as it is here. Well, I hope it does for you because that was beautiful. And uh, thank you, worship team and voices and instruments. Thank you for uh, saying, okay, Lord, whatever we have to do, we'll do what we have to do to give you glory and honor and worship you today. And, and here we are uh, coming to you live from the, from the fellowship hall. Gosh, we have so much. When you wonder if you have enough, you just look around and you have, obviously, way too much. We're thankful as a church that we could adjust in the midst of our uh, little bit of mess. And the uh, ministry support team, all the tech people and the sound people, everyone making sure that we could be in here to do everything. Pastor Dwayne and the whole crew, thank you, everyone, uh, for just uh, saying, okay, Lord. What is it? This should be just our living sacrifice, our simple thing, and uh, do whatever you'd have us to do. So here we are. We're going to go to Ecclesiastes 11 today. Um, probably everybody knows everything that happens, you know. I think that uh, word gets fast, gets out fast. We've covered that in Ecclesiastes. A bad word gets around pretty fast. <laughs> and this was a bad word. Let's get it right out of the way, Bobby. It was like you being at Victoria Falls in Livingston while you were watching me in the water the other day. And uh, just so you know, now that's covered. And so, so you, I was the only one in the building when this little guy that hangs from the ceiling on the south storage area by the air conditioner unit got broken by a pipe. The pipe did not break by itself. When I was a kid, I always used to tell my mom, it broke. Well, it did not break. Um, I bumped into it, and it broke. And uh, in the midst of a few seconds, uh, this happened around 3.30 Thursday afternoon. And here you go. Here's your short version. You can add all the extra stuff. I heard there was... 218,415 gallons of water poured out. I heard we had a flood, uh, but the building's still here. So if we had a flood, you know, I don't know. But we had a couple thousand gallons of water pour out of that pipe. Let me tell you, your CJC, FBD, boy, they move. There was a phone call from the Tyco people, whom we love so very much, but their monitoring system made a phone call. Of course, I was not very excited at the moment, and I told them, take their time. Everything's fine here. No, I didn't. This is an event. It's not a fire. There's water every, get them here. Well, can I have your, no, you can't have anything. Please get them here. The fire department, which is right up the street, thank you, God, they were here within moments. The only funny thing about that is, and they're, they're tremendous people, but of course, they parked up in the couple units came up in here and they showed up and I was telling Brian, Brian used to be emergency response guy and they come up and uh, I was going, come on guys, go shut the water off. And they're going, mm. I mean, got the big outfits on and they're, you know, come on and shut the water off. I messed up. The place is a mess. Oh. He must be on something. No, I'm very wet at that time. The funny part about it is that I was the only one in the building. Thank you, Lord. When it all happened, Bobby walked in. He had an appointment that afternoon on Thursday, and uh, he came in, and uh, I was telling Pam a little bit today and others, if you've ever been in and out of our storage area on the south wing, you have to kind of navigate through an air handling unit that had to be replaced 2011 because we were robbed back then and our air conditioning units were stripped and so we had a new one put in so the pipe had to be put a certain place but we've been working on that why we didn't get it moved a long time ago well just to have this kind of excitement today i don't know or thursday but uh we are always very very wise after the fact but that's okay accidents happen and this accident i'm thankful for all the blessings and our message today is going to be talking about being blessed. It does come out of Ecclesiastes 11, and there's, there's a lot of these ten, in these 10 verses, a lot about being blessed and, and the blessing that 
Solomon shows, and it fits perfectly. We've had a message or two over the few years that I've been preaching through the Word of God with you about being blessed or having blessings, and this is just a beautiful fit. Thank you, God, for that. But let me just follow that all up with this. The phone calls that were all made and all things that had to be done within 30 minutes, which is really unconscionable. I went through my records of things, everything that I've written down uh, of the events on Thursday and Friday. Serve Pro was out here. The on-site, there were two people on-site. They were project managers. Uh, they did a walkthrough with the uh, fire department people, which, again, they're tremendous. I met a man named Phil, uh, the lead on the work there, and he was tremendous. Everything that had to be done, ServPro came after it. They were on it. They were doing it, and uh, within an hour, they had a crew out here. Within another hour, they had machines out here. Within, by 1.30 at night, when I asked them to leave me a voicemail, and they left here at 1.30 on Friday early morning, uh, of course, uh, very late Thursday night, they had had this intricate air moving, water removing, dehumidifying system put in, and uh, your church is getting better, uh, excuse me, you're going to be better and you're going to be all right. You're the church, but the church building is getting better and they work hand in hand and everything is getting better. Water went from upstairs where the hundreds and hundreds and hundreds, if you want to say thousands and thousands just for preaching, that's fine. Uh, gallons came out, flooded upstairs, which is small, but it found the lobby, a little bit of the coffee house. Uh, they sucked that up first, which I was very thankful. I asked them to do that because we know the concrete might stain, right, Josh? And so, hey, they did that, and then they moved in and worked in, and uh, our brand new carpet, of course, and everything. So here's the tough part is that uh, I was looking forward to all of you walking into your church building today, all the investment all of you have made, all the beautiful work we finished, uh, had all the carpet finished. By Thursday, there was a walkthrough being gone. We have new lights in the auditorium, new paint. Uh, the only thing left is doing the sound, the trim, the, the carpet, all the nursery, uh, brand new carpet everywhere. Oh, it was going to be so fun today, but we'll have to wait for another day because with all of this being, of course, in our insurance and we have good insurance, that was a phone call that had to be made. This will be a big insurance claim and they're working on everything, but things are drying out. The carpet will have to be done again, and, uh, and all that has to happen, we'll make sure that it's all taken care of by the pros, and we do have some good people. Uh, the leak in the backflow system was taken care of. Do you have a problem with me? There's somebody walking all over the place distracting me terribly. I don't know what to do. Just kidding. I have to have a little fun. But going through all of that... Um, the National Fire Suppression people came out and fixed the leak Friday, uh, the bust out of there and out of the pipe and everything, and, and made sure that we had fully operational. The Blue Springs City came out and got the power turned, excuse me, Evergy came back out to turn the power back on after the code people of Blue Springs City had to clear the building to make sure it was safe. So from the moment of everything happening, the fire department closing the building down, the power being shut off by Evergy uh, to now here we are having a Sunday morning service and that's really, really awesome. So thank you everyone again and, and it helps you to know that that was really just a moment of time uh, and things like that that are very serious and I take it very, very seriously and everyone does here and the team being out here, I called them and I told hey, I need a couple of you out here and whew, everybody was here and thank you for praying being supportive. Thank you for texting and sending return uh, emails of offering to help and be part of things. And uh, hey, we're in it. We're going to be able to walk through this. And uh, through our message today, you'll see that truly we are blessed beyond measure. Our theme verse remains out of Ecclesiastes chapter number one. And I gave my heart to seek and to search out by wisdom concerning all things that are done under heaven. This sore travail, <laughs> it was sore travail, and it has been sore travail this week. 
hath God given to the sons of man to be exercised therewith without God, without looking at things from the lens of the wisdom of God. If wisdom is bankrupt, then we sit here in a foolishness, in folly, in just utter hopelessness. We're vain and we're full of vexation of spirit. Can you imagine in the lost world? And this is the way that, of course, Solomon is speaking to us as if he was lost, completely apart from God, backsliding away from God and saying, hey, you can't really search things out, figure things out. You're not going to, you could keep on searching and seeking, but you're not going to get all the answers. Who in the world did all this to our church? What happened to all this thing? It's such a tragedy. You could, you could approach it that way. But that's without God. That's under the sun. That's under heaven. God is involved in all of this. And we are truly blessed beyond measure. You know, when you think about this whole series and how we, we're now in chapter number 11, next week will be the men's conference. And so make sure that all of you men that are not signed up, sign up right now. I know you're by your phones while you're on Facebook or whatever. Or, uh, please uh, sign up. We've got about 40-ish guys. We need a few more. Greg Tyler will be here to preach on Friday and Saturday. And he'll be preaching on Sunday right in here. And here's your invitation, men. You're going to have the completed men's conference on Sunday morning right in here, which means you need to be in here, men. Friday, Saturday, Sunday, because that third message will be for the whole church, but it'll be particularly for you men. We'll make sure there's enough chairs in here. We will not be in the auditorium, but we'll make sure that we can finish out and complete and have what God would have for us right here. Of course, it'll all be online as well next Sunday. But hey, make sure, men, to sign up for our conference. We're going to have to <laughs> refine our vision. And that's the theme of it. Think about Stephen right now, the apostle, looking up and seeing Jesus before he's stoned. His vision for Jesus. It wasn't about how in the world do you, God, see me. It was the other way around. How do you see Jesus? How do you and I, we need to refine our vision of Jesus, men and women. But that's going to be our conference, our men's conference. In light of thinking of all that, and we are in Ecclesiastes 11, let me just give you this simple title. A deeply blessed life. We have a deeply blessed life. We have a blessed life as individuals. We have a blessed life as a church. We have a blessed life in so many ways. In the simplicity of just even physical family. Yesterday I had a chance to go out to Topeka and blow up some balloons. Actually watch my daughter and Andrew do a whole lot better job and decorate for Maddie's fifth birthday. Oh, my granddaughter's five years old. Tomorrow is her official birthday. She wants to have a birthday every day. You know how that goes. You know Bobby, the girl. They got, I think Stacy still has a birthday month. Is that, is that a birthday month? And maybe some of you do. But Maddie might be getting there already. But, but again, it was just a beautiful day. And any of you, you know, when you think about birthdays with your family, your kids, and the grandchildren, or whatever, you just go to somebody's birthday... It's a, it's a fun time. It's a blessed time. But that's just a small piece of how blessed our lives are. But I wonder, I think sometimes life makes you and I believe everyone else has the blessed life. And you don't. Everybody else has got such a blessed life. Everybody, everybody else, well, look at me. My life is, I don't know, I got some blessings, but I don't know if I really have a blessed life. From last week in Ecclesiastes 10, this might line up from verse number 17. Blessed art thou, O land, when thy king is the son of nobles, and thy princes eat in due season for strength and not for drunkenness. We spoke in our last point about those under officers of the leader and how they might be a little bit foolish. They might not handle their position well. And they might say, well, ha, blessed art thou, O land, when the king is the son of the nobles, and say, hey, one day I'm going to be in charge. 
the nobles, hey, nobles, you're supposed to have this responsibility of handling the office that you have. But sometimes maybe you don't take it seriously, or maybe you become critical of the leader over you. Well, sometimes we just look at others and say how blessed they are. Look at how blessed they are when the king is the son of the nobles. Gosh, wow, the king was them, but then the king becomes, because he's the son of the nobles, he becomes the king. Now it kind of flips on him. It's almost like us thinking that the only blessed part of life is the physical on this earth. Ah, oh, I got a position. Ah, oh, I got some more money. Ah, oh, I made sure that now I'm in a spot where at my job, I can never lose my job. I got a better house. I got all that spot. And maybe you look at everybody else and go, hey, this says Ecclesiastes 10, 17 says, Blessed art thou, O land, when the king is the son of the nobles. And the princes eat and do see it. I mean, they do whatever they want. Look at their lives. Look at how beautiful. They, they were born into it. What a life they have. We're to be in a place where we have maturity. And our eldership in church ought to be in a place where in leadership in church and pastoral leadership that, hey, we understand that the blessed life, really, those things are nice and I understand that, but the blessed life is what we have in the Lord Jesus Christ. Solomon knew that, you see. Solomon knew about the blessed life. In fact, that man had such a blessed life. In fact, maybe we wonder, and we've mentioned in our message that messages that maybe it was just insatiable, his appetite for being blessed. The wisest man, the richest man. That wasn't seeming to be enough. I need more horses. I need more chariots. I need more monies. I need more gifts from people. But there was a time when Moses wrote Proverbs. And when he wrote Proverbs, he went, wait a minute. I have some wisdom about being blessed. It says in Proverbs 8.32, Now therefore, hearken unto me, O ye children. For blessed are they that keep my ways. You see, Solomon knows what it means to be blessed. Proverbs 8.34, Solomon wrote this, Blessed is the man that heareth me, watching daily at my gates, waiting at the posts of my doors. Here is Solomon referencing the holy God of the universe, knowledge, understanding, and wisdom, and saying, hey, blessed is the man that heareth me, watching daily at my gates. Proverbs 10.7, the memory of the just is blessed, but the name of the wicked shall rot. That's a toughie. Whew. The memory of the just is blessed, but the name of the wicked, ooh, it shall rot. Blessed life, having that kind of life, the just person is blessed, and that memory of the just person, what a great, great proverb, because we know the word blessed means happiness, the true deepening thought of the happiness in, lo in the Lord. Blessed are you. Blessedness. Happiness. And so when I look at Proverbs 22 9, I like this one. It fits to our message today. He that hath a beautiful eye shall be blessed for he giveth of his bread to the poor. Someone that notices there's a need and they say, hey, blessed are they that Look out and see with a bountiful eye. They have much and they say, here, I'm going to give to you. I'm going to give you bread. I'm going to bestow upon you because I'm blessed to continue to bless. Would you consider that the possibility is this? That we at Jesus' church may be missing out on a deeply blessed life. Solomon was missing out on a deeply blessed life at this time of his life. Near the end of his life, he had lost track of, in fact, of course, we know, vanity, vexation of spirit. He was in a place of purposelessness, empty. Again, we all want to figure out why certain things happen. In the midst of it all, I look at how blessed we are on the other side of the why. What have we out of this? We're not in a place of vapor and emptiness and nothingness. We're not in a vain life. We're in a blessed life. And we need to realize that Jesus, as Jesus' church, sometimes we're missing out on the deeply blessed life. The protectiveness that went on on that Thursday is overwhelming to me the more I thought about it. 
no one was in this building. No one was in this building. No one got hit with sheetrock, which it didn't, by the way. The sheetrock is intact. No one got hit with a ceiling tile. No one got hit with a couple gallons of water. No one got injured. The pipe fell. It dropped. The air went The dry system, after three seconds, became no longer dry. It was now wet. But think where it broke. A few years back, we had one happen, and one of the sprinkler head areas was all the way down the hallway, down door Josh's office, put water everywhere. In Dwayne's office, the financial office, Josh, just water everywhere went into the auditorium. Because the backflow system and all this piping can get a little leak. And when the air goes out, the system ignites. It's dry. There's no water in it. But once it goes dry in the air, and the air gets leaked out, it thinks there's a fire. Duh, I am glad. Why in the world does it go off? Well, let me ask you a question. How many times have you, been experienced, have you experienced credit card fraud? But now you're out there and you're putting your credit card in and they say, just a minute, we need to call to check. And you're going, oh, I can't believe they're checking on my card. I can't believe they're just holding me up. I want to make a purchase. Aren't you glad they're checking on the fraud for your credit card? We have to be so thankful that that system was in place. Do I like the water everywhere? No. The damage? Oh, gosh. Again, we should be, as someone said, it's so refreshing to see all this carpet when they saw it Wednesday. It just gives us such an airy feel. Uh, we'll get there. But I think sometimes Jesus' church misses out on the incredibly, deeply blessed life. Are you missing out personally? So let's make it personal for about 10 seconds here. Are you missing out on a blessed life as the father's child? If you're the father's child, believer, this message is for you today. If you're lost today and listening to this, you need to become a child of the father through the Lord Jesus Christ. It is for by grace that you can be saved through faith, not of yourself. It's the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. If you call on the name of the Lord to save you, believe in your heart, confess with your mouth, you can be saved. And then you enter in this brand new, new life that's deeply blessed. Believer, you have that life. Have you forgotten? Have we forgotten? You have such a life in the Lord. And in Solomon's words, in just these 10 verses, we'll cover them quickly, make two practical lesson points at the end, and we'll be done. I want you to see that it is quite a life that we have, contrary to Solomon thinking the way he thinks about life. He seems like he's got a little swing here in chapter number 11 and 12, kind of moving a little bit toward at least entering God into things again, as we mentioned last week. I think that he realizes his foolish behavior and his absence of wisdom, he's missed the deeply blessed life of God. He really has missed what it really means when you look at that to have that kind of life. Life is an adventure, I know that. Life is a beautiful gift, and we ought to say, okay, God, show, show me how to live this life in a place where it's deeply blessed, no matter what. Join me, Ecclesiastes 11. We'll break it down, 10 verses. Take us just a few moments. Our message will go smoothly as we pray, but you never know. Just never know. Hey, real quick. Commercial, 10 seconds. We got hit by lightning a few years ago, and nobody got hurt. Lightning storm hit the pump in the, in the pond, all came underneath there, and just went into our main power area. That sound, didn't sound like that, but it sounds good like that. It made some noise, though. I'm glad I wasn't around for that one. Well, I was in my office, but not near it. You think about all the deep, different things that can happen. And we say thank you, God. And for us being able to be in here, 
to do what we're doing right now? Thank you, God. It says in verse number one of Ecclesiastes 11, I heard a message probably 30 years ago on this from Rochester. Cast thy bread upon the waters, for thou shalt find it after many days, relating, of course, to the bread, the word of God, the seed going out to people. I heard that side of it. It's powerful. Of course, Solomon is making an application as an owner of many, many grains and many, many boats and getting his, getting his ships out there so that he can get those things done on the practical, excuse me, <clears throat> on the historical side of it, but in an application spiritually. Cast thy bread upon the waters, for thou shalt find it after many days. Verse number two, give a portion to seven, also to eight, for thou knowest not what evil shall be upon the earth. If the clouds be full of rain, they empty themselves upon the earth. And if the tree fall toward the south or toward the north, in the place where the tree falleth, there it shall be. Now, when you read stuff like that, you go, wow, if I read that and tell that to somebody, I'm pretty smart. See, wherever the tree falls, it is. Walk off. I'm out of here. It's pretty smart, huh? If the clouds are full of rain, well, wait a minute. In the Midwest, we don't know. They mean, you know, it come by, and it was supposed to be last night. And of course, a couple of dents in your car if you had your car outside and you got hail hit. Did anybody get any hail? Wasn't that fun? Hmm. I'm thankful I got my car back after my lax accident. I'm not putting that in. Oh, my goodness. I'm full of accidents these days. Sheesh. Go ahead, say it. Go ahead. You're thinking it. Come on. It's not as bad as that Hyundai down at camp. Brownie, my gosh, what is the matter with you? The first three verses to me hit us in this idea of investing. You and I need to be seeing in these three verses investing in life cast your bread upon the waters again in the historical setting of it solomon's saying hey i got this grain i am a businessman i'm a merchandiser i want it to make some money i want it to get into the ground i want to be able to sell it i want to i mean think about joseph working in egypt to save his people with grain so there's the principle there historically but spiritually speaking, think about the seed and the sower. This is primed material right there. See, I snuck that in there. Free commercial for the youth group. Primed right out of, again, Luke 8. Seed, sower, soil, bam. How about that one in Psalm 126? We had to memorize this one a long time ago. He that goeth forth and weepeth, bearing precious seed, shall doubtless come again with rejoicing, bringing his sheaves with him. A spiritual return on putting that word out, putting the seed out. There's so much beautiful. When you invest the word of God, there's going to be a return. When you invest the product of God that he made in his creation, he, by the way, it's kind of funny, man's been making merchandising and money off of God's products for centuries. God started it all. I wonder if he's getting any percentage, any royalty on anything of the man. Oh, he's supposed to get 10 per... Oh, I, I won't go into it. Okay, okay, okay. But here's where we're at. The harvest for another year has to come. The merchant's preparing for it. We know the Galatians piece of... Um, scripture freeze moment. <laughs> Sowing and reaping. What's the verse? What's the verse? For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. Sowing, putting it out there, doing it. Hey, you want to have something in return? Beautiful. Verse 2, if you want to bless people, put out seven. Put out eight. One day, maybe the return will come. You're not really doing it for the return, but thou knowest not, verse number 2, not what evil shall be upon the earth. So do something for somebody when you have the ability to do it. It teaches in Luke chapter number 6. I can go there real quick if you want to join me. I'll just read it really fast. You know the principle. This is Jesus' sermon to the Gentiles. And he's talking about verse 36 and, and, and chapter 6 of Luke. Be therefore merciful as your Father is also merciful. Judge not, you shall not be judged. Condemn not, you shall not be uh, condemned. Forgive, and you shall be forgiven. Verse 8. Luke 8, I mean Luke 6, 38. 
Give, and it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, shall men give into your bosom. For with the same measure that you meet with all, it shall be measured to you again. The principles in the words, Solomon saying, even in his roughest times, invest. Invest, invest, invest. Invest with the word, invest with the things that God's given you. Make an investment for a return. Because he that goeth forth and weepeth. You will not regret sowing the seed of the word of God. We go to the next three verses, verse number four, five, and six. He that observeth the wind shall not sow, and he that regardeth the clouds shall not reap. Very simply, when the weather's kind of goofy, you don't just jump on it. Oh, I'm going to go out there and sow some seed while the wind's 40 miles an hour. Yesterday would not have been a good day to put out the seed. (laughs) Right, Nance? A farmer understands this principle. This is now as a merchandiser first. Now it's a person who's a farmer with farming principles. we got to do things right. Okay, there's a big rain going. We'll put it out and get washed into the, I can't tell you how many, <laughs> how many bags of fertilizer are in the pond. I bet you when we drain the pond someday, there's going to be like the best like, uh, greenhouse in there. Fertilizer, and it gets washed into there. And then you look at the field and go, what happened to the fertilizer? It's in the pond. You don't do it then. You don't sow them. You wait for the rain. You sow and then have a little steady rain. Of course, we all want to predict how it's going to go. But it's a great principle in verse 4. Verse 5, as thou knowest not what is the way of the spirit. Remember Jesus spoke to Nicodemus about this? Spirit, wind. You understand a principle about someone when they come to know Christ is a new life in Christ. The Holy Spirit is as the wind. Can't see it. But you know it by the wind blowing. There's a great principle here. And thou knowest not with the way of the spirit, nor how the bones do grow in the womb of her that is with child. Do you, can you explain that mystery? How the, how the mystery of the wind is the mystery of the Holy Spirit. The mystery of how that baby grows in the tummy and then comes out. It's just, an, oh gosh. Even so, thou knowest not the works of God who maketh all. Do you know everything? We've established that in this series We don't even have hardly a hem of the garment of knowing about God, but we have to continue to seek and search out in our hearts. Verse 6, in the morning sow thy seed, and in the evening withhold not thine hand, for thou knowest not whether shall prosper, either this or that, or whether they both shall be alike good. What it says up there on the screen, very simply, off of verses 4, 5, and 6, life has many mysteries. You do what you are supposed to do by the word of God. Follow the will of God. Follow what he tells you. I don't know how it's going to turn out. You have a covering over the word, and from the word, the word will cover you over. Just do what God wants you to do. Simple principle. Emergency. Something happens. Tyco, emergency services, fire department, they come on board. They say the power has to be shut off. They shut the power off. Great. Got to be a safe situation. Now you give it over to the experts. Do what you're supposed to do. How is this all going to turn out? I don't know. But give it over to the experts. Call Serve Pro. Thank you for coming out. God ordained it. Call the National Fire Suppression people. Could you please shut off the compressor? It's making so much noise. But... All those things are in. You're just doing. Well, spiritually speaking, do what you know to do. God says to have relationship with him on a daily basis, brother and sister in the Lord, family members. Spend time with him. He says he calls you to worship. He calls you into the word of God and communion with him every day. It says daily, 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 daily. That should be a good camp theme. Daily, daily, daily. If any man will come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. So we're supposed to, oh, no, that was just for when you first get saved. It's all the time. Life has many mysteries, but if I would just do what I'm supposed to do, Jesus talked of how things are going to work. I'm going to put him in place. He did it in 40, 40, 36 to 42 months of his earthly ministry. He put the time and purpose of everything in place for you and me. God gave us the holy word of God, 66 books. And you know what? When you and I look at things and wonder what's the future going to hold, that's okay. Because the ignorance of future does not determine for you to be in fear. 
The ignorance of your future determines that you should act by faith. It's still there. It hasn't moved anywhere. And this guy, Solomon, is starting to kind of get the tip of the iceberg here of really what life's supposed to be out about because this next chapter tells us that he seems to be having a reboot. Verse number 7 and 8. Truly the light is sweet, a pleasant thing is for the eyes to behold the sun. For if a man live many years and rejoice in them all, yet let him remember the days of darkness. For they shall be many. All that cometh is vanity. You know, we've heard something like this in our study. Young life ends when old comes. A lot of wisdom there. I heard somebody talking. I don't know if it was a, I don't know what platform it was on uh, this week and talking about the person being 90 years old and how, what's keeping you going? And exercise, I stay. In fact, one of the things that just resonated with this person saying this was, I still am active and I do not believe that I can't do some things anymore. I still can do and keep going, and I've been blessed with my life. That type of thing, that kind of statement. I'm going, young life ends when old comes. We'll look at the other side of that in a minute, but think of this. You don't want to stay a little baby all the time. Kids, when they're 5, they want to be 10. When they're 10, they want to be 15. You know the whole story. But when they get to be 30, they want to be 21. I want to be 21 again, not happening. But young life, Solomon tells us, ends when old comes. I don't want to repeat the mistakes of my younger years <laughs> and the mistakes of my older years. But the older year mistakes, with a little bit of wisdom from God, allow you to really step back and see God at work. When you're young, you don't see God at work. A lot of times you just, bless life. What are you kidding me, Pastor? I don't have any blessed life. You know what? I don't want to stay in the young life to be a baby immature. I want to stay young in my thinking of the Lord while I progress in maturity. We're talking about maturity. When old comes, you understand God's incredible goodness. God's incredible sovereignty. God's incredible providence, his promises. You understand, just like Solomon's telling these people, hey, young people, take advantage of your young days before the days of darkness when you get older there. Do all that you can. I wonder sometimes if people in the age between 60 and 80, if they're sedentary and not doing much because they didn't do much when they were younger either. That comes from these two verses. Solomon's saying, don't let it happen. Get active now. Move that to a place where you're active in the Lord's work, serving the Lord, being in worship, having great habits, because darkness is coming, and the young life will end when you get old. So let's take the young ability with the old maturity and see what Solomon says here in verses 9 and 10. Rejoice, O young man, in thy youth. Rejoice. Rejoice, young man. Rejoice, young people. Rejoice, all of you young people that still haven't got out of bed, but maybe listen to this in a recording later. Rejoice, young people, in thy youth. Be thankful for the young years, and let thy heart cheer thee in the days of thy youth, and walk in the ways of thine heart and in the sight of thine eyes. But know thou that for all these things God will bring thee unto judgment. Watch out what you choose. Be not deceived, God is not mocked. Whatsoever man soweth, thou shalt he also reap. Verse number 10, therefore remove sorrow from thy heart, put away evil from thy flesh, for childhood and youth are vanity. So it says up there on the other side of this, contentment in older life. It's okay to get a little older. Aren't you glad, Mark, you got a little older? Remember that young principal a few years ago I met? Ooh, you knew so much. <laughs> But being content with your older years. Young people enjoy the young, enjoy those times, but be careful that youth isn't a place of vanity. We're not saying that you just, ah, skip the young years, I just need to grow up all the time. Be careful on that parents and grandparents, well, you just need to grow up. What you want to do is have them learn at a young age how to serve God. Well, above that, how to serve God, how to just worship God through the Lord Jesus Christ to have a beautiful relationship with their best friend, Jesus. 
Girls, best friend is Jesus. Guys, best friend is Jesus. Your best friend is Jesus Christ. You don't need any other bestie. Well, I got five of them. No, you only can have one bestest. We'll put another EST on it, and that's Jesus Christ. Be content in your older life. That's just a little thought from an old guy. Because a deeply blessed life is reminded here that, hey, you could write all kinds of things down, and you could say all kinds of lessons of your young years, and you could put them all and get there, but even getting there and not really living in that older life of wisdom, it's like God taught you so many beautiful lessons, and you went, eh, whatever. How's it go? The, the youth is wasted on the young I thank God for the deeply blessed life I have. I thank God for the deeply blessed life that we have as a church. I thank God for what he has done. How he's intertwined principles in here that are not, they're not of the devil, they're of the spirit of the living God. There's no competition here over who's better in Jesus Christ. We're all in Christ together. There's no competition on who knows most or who can do the most. I can outserve you and then stuff it to you. How about just serve a little more in Jesus' name and be a little bit more like Jesus? That's a deeply blessed life. I, I don't know if I... There's so many people around this ministry that make it a deeply blessed life together that when the tough stuff comes, which they're coming... I love how God shines through his people. Hey, the sparks fly upward, as Job says. You know, goofy things are going to happen this week, this month, this year. We need to move through it. So here's your two simple lessons. Go to Psalm 127. It is said that it's possible that Solomon did write Solomon 70, uh, Solomon, Psalm 72. I wrestle with that. It says for him, and it could be of him. But it's a messianic psalm in Psalm 72. But Psalm 127, that is Solomon's. It belongs to him. And there's so much here in just five verses. But I'm just going to give you a little something to chew on today as we finish up our lesson. Here's two little pieces and parts coming from Psalm 127, again, which is Solomon's psalm. There's not a lot here, but there's a lot here. It's not in a bunch of syllables or a bunch of letters. It's really in the beef, the spirit, the, the power of these words here and the principle. Remember, after you have Psalm 119, then there's a series of songs come. They're the songs of degrees. They're the stepping stones on the outer side and the back side of the temple where they walked up each one of these steps and stairs for worship. Each one of them is a song of degrees. 127 is sitting right in the middle here. They go up to 133, 134, I believe, is the last one. And here you have Psalm 127. Let me read it, and then we'll make our two lesson thoughts. Except the Lord build the house, they labor in vain that build it. Except the Lord keep the city, the watchman waketh but in vain. Familiar, familiar. Verse 2, it is vain for you to rise up early, to sit up late, to eat the bread of sours, for so he giveth his beloved sleep. Lo, children are an heritage of the Lord, and the fruit of the womb is his reward. As arrows are in the hand of a mighty man, so are children of the youth. Happy is the man that hath his quiver full of them. They shall not be ashamed, but they shall speak with the enemies in the gate. Have some kids. I've heard so many neat little takes on that. I'll just say, quiver, five, whatever, just, yeah, have some kids. If you have one really good one, maybe you want to stop. I don't know. But the quiver full of them and that principle. Out of Psalm 127, I want you to see how this deeply blessed life works because Solomon wrote this. First thought. We are deeply blessed because the Lord God who built the house will be faithful to keep guard over what belongs to him. 
I had four different firemen come up to me and say, you're standing in here and this is all happening and from what I understand, God's going to take care of this. Phil, the man that was the lead CJC guy, says, I'm a man of deep faith of the Lord. I love the Lord. I'm a deeply spiritual man. I walk by faith. And I got to tell you, everybody will say this to you, but it's going to be all right. Everything's going to be fine. No one got hurt. That's powerful stuff. This is God's building. God made this little house. God made this little place. It's his. And it says that, except the Lord build the house, they labor in vain. This is not in vain. All the work that has to be done, all the things that have been done for 25 years in the church building stuff, but 20 years in our building, God has said, I will be faithful to keep guard over it because it belongs to me. That is an incredible principle. What about your home? You ought to dedicate that house that becomes a home and say, God, I want you to be faithful to keep guard over what belongs to you. Hey, people, a lot of you have bought houses the last year or two or three. If you haven't done it yet, you ought to do it now. You ought to dedicate that house to the Lord. And you say, Lord, this is your house. I want it to be your home. Jesus Christ, you're the center and head of this house, and I want you to care for it and guard it. That's the principle here. God guards this place. I love it a lot. I've got a lot invested. My family's got a lot invested. But that doesn't matter because everyone else has got even more invested than I do. But God's got even more than that than any of you invested in this place. This is his carpet. It's his electronics. It's his lighting. He gave the go to turn it off or to shut it off. Turn it off. Wait, how's that going to shut it off and turn it off? Yeah, that's the way it goes. Turn it on or shut it off. He can grant anything to happen at any time, at any place, in any way. Simple. Here's your second one. That's out of the first two verses. Here's your second one. Verses number three through five show me something that's beautiful here. We are deeply blessed because the Lord God who birthed the fruit. There's been fruit in this ministry since the time that we moved here in 1998. It started before that with the founding pastor coming out and the people that came out and different people that have been part of that. With all the people that led people to the Lord. People that were baptized in little water. We're seeing pictures of all that stuff and little water trough and all that stuff to the place where people have been baptized in that baptismal area in there. They've been born again. The Lord God birthed the fruit, the spiritual fruit. And he will be faithful to preserve his heritage that belongs to him. It's his promise. Sealed by the Holy Spirit. It's a promise that when you're born into his family, he will keep you, he will watch over you, he will preserve his heritage. It says there, again in verse 3, Lo, children and heritage of the Lord and the fruit of the womb, this is his reward. I know that's a physical piece, but think of it in the church. As arrows are in the hand of mighty men, so are the children of the youth. Hey, let's have more people come to know Jesus Christ as Savior. When you look at Psalm 127, and Solomon wrote this in verses number 3, 4, and 5, it says, 5, happy is the man that hath his quiver full of them. They shall not be ashamed. They will speak with the enemies in the gate. When you're saved, born again, you know the Lord. You are fruit of the Lord. You are a child of God. And in his heritage, he says, I'm going to take care of you. I'm going to watch over you. I'm going to guard the house that I built, and I'll be faithful to it, and I will take care of the fruit that I birthed. I'll be faithful to preserve my heritage. This is my heritage, the God of the universe says. I am the father of you. I know it's Father Abraham and all that stuff, but I'm the father in the Lord Jesus Christ. I put very simply this. God's going to preserve and take care of this church beyond anything that I could ever do or anything we, we're going to do what we're supposed to do, but he's going to take care of this church as long as he says, you are my heritage and you're doing that which I called you to do. And I thank God for that. So I ask you to finish up. What does a deeply blessed life mean? 
to our church. What does a deeply blessed life mean to our church this morning? Sometimes something like this just reminds you how much you have in the Lord. Most of all the people. House to house in the temple, praying with one accord, praising God, having favor with all the people. 25 years of God's favor. I just look around in this room and there's sound and projectors and all that stuff, but most of all, I see people. People that said, I'll be here to take care of things today, Pastor. I'll make sure that I'm here. How blessed are we? How blessed. The father of his children, the sons of God, says, I will preserve my heritage and I will guard my house. You know who's guarding all of this? Your God in heaven. He is guarding everything. One day I'll come see you. For now, we carry on with what you called us to do. Please join me in a word of prayer. Our Father in heaven, it's been so sweet to be able to accomplish that which we desire right here and right now, to give you honor and glory, holy God, Lord God Almighty. Thank you for the beautiful music this morning, the sound, the singing, the instruments, and all that praise that lifted your name on high. Man of sorrows, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus for taking that passion, that suffering to the cross, to the grave, and to the resurrection to show us as the church, oh, how blessed we really are. If it all was done, all we could say is thank you, God, for the blessing upon blessing. But it's not done. You've called us out to do a work and continue to do the work that you've called us to do in this community. So God, I pray as you guard the house that you built. Because we, God, have built this thing upon Jesus Christ, the head of the body, Jesus Christ, the rock. And truly, this work is made up of beautiful people. I pray you bless them, watch over them, make us aware this week of how blessed we really are. We are a deeply blessed church and people. And I pray, God, you preserve your heritage, that it will be way beyond me and all the others and those young that will grow older, We'll learn the lessons from your word and grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Thank you for everyone making things work today. Most of all, thank you, Jesus. It's in your name we pray. Amen.